Good afternoon. My name is Brian Gallagher. I'm the CEO of United Way Worldwide, and you found your way to the New Champions, New Challenges session. And uh, you, uh, e even though we're, uh, we're small in number, you've made a great choice. This is an unbelievably talented panel, and uh, I think you'll see that in just a minute. You know, let me just frame the, the conversation a bit before I introduce the panel. Um, clearly, the economic and political shift in the world is dramatic and, and compelling, fairly obvious. Uh, the move from west to east, north to south. And, you know, for the last day and a half or so, we've mostly been, from my perspective, examining growth and uh, how to maintain growth, how to uh, trade between countries, industry sectors, and so forth. And today, we're going to take a look at the new champions you know, the Indias, Chinas, Brazils of the world, and uh, how, how do they balance their economic growth with uh, and confront their most critical development issues as well? Uh, we'll take a look and ask our panel to think about uh, the role of international aid versus internal sustainability and investment, the role of government, uh, the social contract, um, inclusiveness in, in growth, and, and so forth. And we'll ask them to all take on a, a question in, in just a moment. But uh, as we get into that, let me introduce the panel. And they're a little bit out of order for my card, so I'm going to flip back and forth. So bear with me. Um, to my left is John Rangambwa. He's the Minister of Finance and Economic Planning for Rwanda. To, uh, to his left is Minister Abdul Mal Muhit. He's the Minister of Finance for Bangladesh. Next. Next to the minister is Re Rebecca Grinspan, UN Undersecretary General, Associate Administrator, UN Development Program. Next to, next to Rebecca is Hirota Arakawa. He is the Vice President, Japan International Cooperation Agency. And then finally at the end, Chandra Nair, Founder and CEO, Global Institute for Tomorrow. So if I could, and why don't we just start by going right down, right down the row, uh, three or four minutes, if you would. Minister, starting with you, as, as you look at economic growth as it relates to development and aid, uh, what are the most one or two most uh, important shifts that are, that are taking place? And how, does it, how do those shifts affect how you do your work in both at a, an ministry level as well as government? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think the two main shifts today is, uh, speaking from the development world point of view, development country point of view, where we still have aid playing a big role in our development, I think the big shift in the last, uh, say, five, ten years is how this aid is delivered, the relationship between the donors and the recipients. This notion of partnership that has come in, I think that has helped in a way uh, in terms of improving the ownership of development programs and uh, increasing the productivity of any aid money we get. So this aid being linked to our development programs and being implemented through mainly country systems, I think that has had a big impact in terms of uh, uh, improving or expediting our, our growth agenda. Of course, that depends also on us as the recipient countries. How best can we plan for development and how best can we implement our development programs? That matters a lot. And that coupled with the willingness of the donors to, to, to let us own our development programs and implement. Uh, so that has been a big shift since uh, 2005 the, with the Paris Declaration. Though there still remains uh, unresolved uh, problems with some, uh, uh, some donors. So that's one. Now, what the challenge or what's requires from us is really building our systems in terms of being able to, to account for, for our resources to our population, not to the donors, which is also a big shift and a positive one. Uh, but also how we implement our development programs and our development agenda. That's a challenge that falls on our shoulders which may be different from the past where donors were giving and they were coming to implement the programs. It wasn't effective at all, 
but wasn't really giving a challenge to the to the recipient countries as as so it's a good challenge that we we are facing and has had for us in Rwanda we've uh, seen high growth numbers averaging about 8.3 percent in the last uh, five years and that's mainly because of this shift right. of course the other important shift is now the newcomers in this industry uh, China India and the other uh, emerging markets not only as as new donors but as investment sources of investors coming to our countries because today we, we are looking beyond just the aid but how do we attract investment we're back, we're only looking in the West. We expected people with money that could invest in our countries were coming from the West. Today we have a dominant uh, a force coming from China, from India. So how you change from this Western way of looking at things and now being able to mix? Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you decide on how you strategize dealing with Chinese investors or Indian investors? vis-a-vis -vis the traditional sources of investment. Investment in terms of reinvestment in our countries, but also as a destination of our exports. So it creates that challenge of being able to diversify on how we deal with the rest of the world, but which I think is a real positive uh, challenge. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, come back, we'll come back to that, that question of the, the, new, the new champions investment. I, I wonder, so it, there's a, a new partnerships between donors and recipient. How are your, do your citizens get involved in that partnership? I mean, or is it, do, do you find that it has to go beyond institutions to get people to understand their role, or, or no? They do. They do in a way we, we have different forums where we engage these partners. We lead it as the Minister of Finance. We lead these engagements. But we have our parliament be, playing a big role in uh, engaging with our partners, with our donors. We have what we call uh, joint reviews of the, our development programs and how these donors are contributing to these programs. And here we invite private sector, we invite the civil society who are really uh, representing the, the citizens. But goes back to, to the, even down to the district levels, we have uh, we've devolved power and resources to the district. So at the district levels, we have what we call the joint action committees, joint action development committees. And there we have different players representing the population, mm. working with the different NGOs and different donors. So yes, they are, they are involved at different levels and uh, uh, represented by different individuals at, as we engage with the partners, with the donors. So it's not only the Minister of Finance doing that. We lead, but we have all the other players in the country. Excellent, excellent. Minister Mohit, your, your thoughts on shifts and how it affects how you're doing your work in Bangladesh? Well, let me begin by quoting from a session we had uh, just a while ago. And there, former Prime Minister Gordon Brown said that the shift is like this. The sources of production have shifted from one region to another. So, how do you distribute the production to the consumers which are somewhere else? Or how do we, I add, or how do you create new consumers? That's the shift. The new champions, 10 of the richest countries in the world, are now in the South, in uh, Latin America, in Asia, in the Middle East, I mean Asia as well, 10 of them are there. This shift is a really a very big shift. It's not the shift of 200 years. It's actually a shift of 300 years. And so it requires a change in the atti attitude of uh, adjusting to this shift. Consumers of the West will continue to be important, but consumers in the new countries is emerging. That's the big change. What's happening in China and Japan? Domestic demand. This is true even in very poor countries like mine, Bangladesh, very poor country but we are depending a great deal on domestic demand. And dependence on domestic demand has completely changed the concept of inclusion. It's not simply inclusion in the financial sector. It's much more. And each country has to decide which is the smart element in the generation of a domestic demand. 
In my country, it's agriculture. In somewhere else, it might be small and medium industries. Somewhere else, it might be infrastructure. So, depending on that, your consumer uh, is not going to be like that. The West is the consumer of the products, production of the East. It's going to be diverse. And that change has to be understood and attitudinal change is necessary. Right. Now, all the donors, practically, are from the West. The OECD. Uh, Korea is a member of the OECD. That's how it's a donor. There are new donors emerging, of course. Even donor like China, donor like many, many Middle Eastern countries, countries which have, which have surpluses. So investable resources, which will still be in greatly in need in many of the South, would have to come from diverse sources, not simply the multinationals that you have, but also other sources, new multinationals have to emerge in China, in, in Japan, in Qatar, and places like that, you see. So that's another change that's going to happen. The source of investment would also diversify. One, one great advantage of the shift of these days is the tremendous advance in information technology, which is actually globalized production, consumption, everything. This in, Information technology, and we have found ways that even poor countries have access to in information technology without creating the information divide. And that's very important. That's one of smart, smart uh, sort of approaches, how you, this, how you use the information technology. So this is a, a shift which will take considerable period of time. It's not a matter of two years, three years. Five years have gone, the shift is taking place, and it will continue for at least another five years. And, and how, how has it changed how you do your work? Yeah, well, you see, my work, let me say, I was a minister uh, 27 years ago. He took I'd, 27 years off and then came yeah. back. I was minister 27 years ago, and 27 years I had nothing to do with the government, and then I came back again as minister. I used to deal with aid in my previous capacity. My main concern was how much aid I harness. Yeah. And my country used to get roughly 8 to 12% of gross domestic product as aid. Today, aid is only 2% or maybe 2.5%. So I have a different way of tackling now. Previously, it was the donors consortium which would decide everything. Today. It is the joint strategy which defines how the relationship will take place. And that is a fundamental change, although Lester Pearson told us in the 1967 that it's development partnership. It was not development partnership in his days. It is now true, actual fact. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Rebecca, what, what do you see? Yes, thank, no, thank you. Thank you very much. A wonderful panel. And very happy to be here. Let me just complement what has already been said and give you some, some numbers of the, uh, uh, the, the, the dramatic shift that we are uh, saying. Uh, the Minister of Bangladesh said that the production now, the majority of the production of the world is done in the South. And in fact, it's, right now it's 50-50, but by 2030, 57% of global production will be in the South. And as he said, what is happening at the same time is not that only that production is, is being done, will be done in the South, but the majority of the middle class of the world will be living in the South. And that will shift completely also the, tra the, the flows in terms of consumption. That is precisely what you were referring to uh, that, we, that we discussed. Let me give you this other uh, number. This is not happening only in Brazil, India, Indonesia, uh, China. This is happening in a wide variety of countries in the world. Right now, 84 countries of the South are growing much faster than the developed world, 84. And part of this phenomena comes also from the emerging economies. You know, the integration of the South, of the growth of the, of the emerging economies with the countries of the South in terms of growth is much more important today than 
ever before in the world. And uh, uh, if, if you want a measure of that, uh, the measure is that 50% of the trade that the South does is South-South no, South trade. So the integration of the South also in terms of growth, production, and trade is more intense today than ever before. Let me, let me just then go to how that affects my work. Yeah. <laughs> And probably uh, one of the ways I want to, to put this, that also the Minister of Rwanda and Bangladesh did, is first of all, this world where you had eight in the north going to the south is over. <laughs> because now we don't have like a clear cut between donors and recipients. The truth is that you live now in a world where you have countries that are donors and recipients at the same time. They are everything at the same time. And that's also a major change with respect to the situation that we had before. You know, you have these emergent countries that have these new responsibilities in the global arena as global players. And at the same time, they have these huge challenges at home. They continue to be developing countries. And this has never happened before. You never had before that the rising economies of the world were at the same time developing countries. And let me give you one, one number there only just to, to finalize. 70%, the, the, I said the, the, the emerging middle class of the world is in the South, but 70% of the extreme poor live in those middle income countries. So is that, this dual role that we have that is making the world completely different from the cooperation perspective and the development perspective from before. And that's changed your priorities both on strategy and funding, I would presume. Uh, absolutely. Let, let me put an example from Latin America. 95% you know, of the financing of UNDP in Latin America comes from the governments of Latin America themselves. Right. Only 5% comes from aid. And that's a phenomenon that we will continue seeing more. You know, aid is more catalytic. It's more for the investment that you don't have the, the seed money for. It's to leverage the private sector investment. It's to build the capacity in the institutions. It's not necessarily to finance the project. Right. Many of the project financing are coming also from the countries themselves. And the, 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 the last point is triangular cooperation is very, very, very important. Uh, let me add one, one thing for the audience, because I think that this has not been stressed enough. But if you look at Rio Plus 20 and what happened in Rio Plus 20, what was more, more important than the outcome document from the intergovernmental process was what happened you know, on the, on the margins of, of the intergovernmental process. What happened in Rio is that there were $513 billion pledged by corporations, private sector, civil society, and governments in initiatives that are like the coalition of the willing, you know? Right. It's big coalitions of private sector, civil society, and governments. That is not necessarily 194 countries, you know, that are really coming together in a cooperation space that is allowed now because of the technologies and the, and, and the, new, the, the, the new communication that, you know, that make a difference in the world. It's, you know, in the Energy for All initiative, there were 50 countries that, you know, pledged to that initiative with $20 billion from corporate money yeah, and yeah. civil society money. And that will change the energy, the energy agenda in the world. Hmm. And that is happening at the same time that you know, the, the other phenomena is, is we'll, taking over. We'll come back to that as well. Uh, Mr. Arakawa, so your agency has been at this a long time. Um, what, as, a, as a donor, what, what shifts do you see and how does it affect your work? Well, thank you, Brian. Um, I'm supposed to presumably speak from the viewpoint of donor, but the uh, overarching agenda here is uh, economic growth. Therefore, uh, I talk about that directory in a short uh, time. The, I'd like to pause 
so-called service industry like uh, call centers or business outsourcing or accounting or logistics and so forth. How we should find the role of modern service industry in economic growth? Previous speakers uh, talked about new dynamics of economic growth. Then I'd like to look into more micro, uh, micro level, uh, sector level issue. From agriculture to manufacturing, then to service industries. This traditional concept of economic transformation is questioned now. In fact, the several Asian countries, including India, Sri Lanka, or Philippines, and so forth, started to achieve strong service-led growth, leapfrogging a manufacturing-intensive stage of development. The nature of the service sector has changed with the new traits of modern services called three Ts, tradability, technology, as the minister said, and transportability. ICT in the intensive modern services are now recognized as an element to drive economic growth. Now I could say new now I could say that we have an alternative path to the traditional manufacturing led growth. There are significant in terms of policy implementation. Uh, policy implications, sorry, especially for the policy makers in developing Asia in this regard. It could provide us with clues on how to cope with the middle income trap. Moreover, service, services tend to recruit more women and cause less adverse effect on environment. Thus, it could contribute to realizing inclusive and green growth. If all this is true, development partners like JICA, my one is JICA, need to review assistance strategy to promote development through modern service industries. In this conjunction, I have to say that there are several preconditions to achieve in this sector. One is global language, like English and quality education, but not rocket science. Number two, quality telecommunication services availability with reasonable cost. Connecting with global market, that's number two. Third, there should be an enabling policy environment for investing in the service sector. Having said so, however, there are two issues to take into account, or what we don't know. Number one, how about employment absorptive capacity in the sector? How many additional employment opportunities can be created? Number two, entry barriers into the service sector are not so high enough to prohibit the others from entering into this sector. This implies that under the given global competitive environment, these service industries already may uh, already invested, may exit or move out to other countries rather easily because comparing to manufacturing sector which require more front-loaded investment. So this is my observation on uh, emerging development model. Thank you. Thank you. And Chandran, finally, uh your view of most important shift or shifts and how you view it? I suppose I'll, I'll try and start on a funny note. I think the most uh, significant shift I've seen in at least the Asia Pacific region in the last 10 years is that today in Asia, uh, more people have access to a mobile phone than a toilet. Um, so this, this makes me feel slightly constipated whenever I think about development <laughs> issues in, in Asia. Uh, somehow we seem to have got our priorities right, wrong. So I think there is a tendency most seriously to, add, to think that technological solutions are essentially some manifestation of development and progress. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a false uh, premise. 
Uh, and the, the analogy of the toilets versus the phone is a serious one because the toilet is now a luxury item in many parts of Asia. I'm not sure if it's in Africa too. Uh, and the, the telephone, the mobile phone is ubiquitous and almost free. Uh, how did something, a device like that, which is technologically advanced, hydrocarbons, heavy metals, etc., become so cheap? An economic model that essentially seeks to externalize costs. So I think in Asia, we need to look at where we've come from. And in the few minutes I have, I think it's very important to understand where we came from. About 60 years ago, in the, in the, the dawn of the post-colonial era, most Asian governments were led by people who were either educated in the West or hated Western leaders. But they said, we want you out. And I think my African friends will, will uh, sympathize with this sentiment. We want you out, but we want to be like you. Okay? But they had no textbooks of their own, so they bought the textbooks from Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard, etc., and said, this is the way you should develop. So they said, okay, we'll go down this route. So being intellectually and ideologically subservient, they followed one economic model. Coming to the point that I'm trying to make, I think, and as yesterday, you know, you heard the premiers talk here, etc., I think there's a realization in Asia that, oh my God, we've gone down this path which is to try and be better than the West, one quarter's down the road, we are beginning to realize we can't go this way for the simple reason that there are far too many Asians and, and Africans too, combined. <laughs> right? And the reality is, therefore, we'll have to look for new economic models. The point I would try to make is that there's a realization in Asia that um, our teachers maybe got it wrong. But the teaching came out of a different world perspective. Two, three centuries of economic dominance, therefore, had a different worldview. It was a worldview exemplified by what is called the American dream. You can have your car, you can drive anywhere, you can do anything you want. In a crowded place like Asia, the development challenge is not to pretend that we can have an economic model where trickle-down economics will somehow lift all boats. And how high will the tide flow? I think the realization is that there are limits. And so I was in a conversation just last week um, in, in, uh, at the APAC forum in Vladivostok, and I will mention uh, the pan, the distinguished panel. But the suggestion was that somehow, Asia, that, that not, the, not in the suggestion, it was made very clear that Asia is developing, there will be some resource constraints, but we will overcome it technologically, and Asians will all have and desire cars. My point is that if you've been to an Asian city, most Asian cities, you will need, know that we need more cars like I need a hole in my head. Right? Tianjin. So the question is, what does development look like? We have transported development from the ba meeting the basic needs to suggesting that somehow we can have all modern conveniences. I don't think a world in 2050, which will, be, which will have about 6 billion Asians, give or take 100 million here or there, can or aspire to live that utopian ideal that everyone will have individual mobility, etc. And the core issue of development in Asia, therefore, will be two points, and I'll finish with that. First, how do we price things? Second, what are your rights? Car ownership is not a human right. And thirdly, what is the role of the state in defining, therefore, how those rights are shared around limited resources? That will require a fundamental rejection of the, what I call the Washington consensus, the economic model of the West, which is consumption-led. But the good thing is I think Asian policymakers are awakening to that reality. The problem is we haven't developed our own narrative. We haven't written our own books. So I'm calling for a thousand PhDs in Asia to look at this dilemma of development. So let's, let's take it from there. Is, um, you know, is development about basic need and, uh, and human development? Or is it, I was struck by the number of times down the panel we heard the word investment. And that- uh, Except me. Except you. <laughs> That's, that's, why we're, that's why we're pivoting off of you. Um, you know, so aid versus, uh, versus investment, the purpose and the motivation, politics, commercial, 
um, uh, you know, hu basic human needs, does it matter? Is, there, is the framework in place for an investment model? Um, no, uh, I think uh, investment will continue to be important, not for producing cars, but for alleviating poverty. It's still, uh, we have, uh, uh, what's the poor, about, uh, uh, about a couple, two billion, two billion. We have still two billion people who are poor. They have to be taken out of that poverty level. And for that, investment is necessary. Investment in energy is necessary. Investment in food production is necessary. And these are the challenges before us now. How do we get that energy in order to give the capacity to work, which will produce the kind of goods that is required? Not cars. Maybe public transportation is what we should emphasize. So a new equation has to be developed of the role of the public sector and the private sector. We suddenly need very, very sort of very developed private sector in our, the new champions countries in order to be able to generate that, generate that investment. It's not simply coming from outside. It will have to come from inside too. That investment, where it would go, is really the question. <coughs> that investment has to go to those little, those little things which give the basic needs, not to the 50% uh, population of the country, but to the 70% poor that live in the South. So, so it's a question of how you uh, restructure your production system. Your production system will supply the requirements of the developed world, yes. Maybe not at the level at which it is now, I think a lifestyle issue becomes extremely important, and perhaps we have time to revisit limits to growth. Thank you. And do, do you think, um, so the, you see, Minister, a role of government to put frameworks in place <coughs> that incent certain investment and, and restrict other investment? You can't. Pri private investment? You can't, you can't stop investment. Right. You have to design a package of uh, uh, policies which would generate investment in the areas that you want. This is the role yeah. of the government. Yeah. Rebecca, you were going to jump in? Yes. I, I think that it's very important not to, not to f uh, uh, fall into false dichotomies. You know? Really, you know, you, you need better quality of growth and you need sustainable inclusive growth. Yes. And that will require a changing you know, uh, uh, the sectors and the consumption patterns, the production patterns and the consumption patterns on the world. So price, pricing accordingly will be very important. But that doesn't mean that everything we do is wrong. <laughs> you know, there are many of the things that we need to do that we know, and there is a, a, a lot of the investment that is going to the, to the right sectors that we need to invest on. So it's about the quality of the investment. It's about the quality of growth. The other false dichotomy is between, uh, you know, the private sector and the state. The truth is that uh, why do we have to, for having one, diminish the other? <laughs> you know, in many of our countries, we need better government and better private sector. And they are complementary. You know, the investment of the private sector cannot be enhanced or leveraged without the investment of the public sector. And you know that you need that complementarity to make growth happen in a sustainable way. So, uh, you know, I think that part of the Washington Consensus problem was to demonize one part mm -hmm. against the other. Mm -hmm. And what we learned from that is two things. One is that we need both. Second is that there is no one size fits all, uh, not by the Washington Consensus, not by any other one. You know, at the end, we will need to find the right a, a, a path for growth according to the specific circumstances that the countries are going through, their specific demographics, their specific a history and institutional a configuration. And there is no one that, you know, we can learn from each other, but the ownership and the crafting of the development path for each of the countries is as important 
at, as the right. rest. There can't be a single definition. No, that. and that's one of the things that you know the global, the emerging economies have shown very clearly. China is not developing in the same way as Brazil or Turkey or Indonesia. You know, what they have done is to open up the matrix of options for development for right. the developing right. world. So let me go to the minister and then Chandra and then come back. Um, sure. So, so yeah. we, we were talking. We were talking in the speaker's room that. Yeah. Rwanda has gone from 50% of GDP in the form of aid to now 42%. So you're balancing this in real time, right? Yeah. You know, investment versus aid. And so how do you think about that but, or how, just react to the discussion? One, I just wanted to support what my colleagues were saying in terms of investment. Today, the other new thing or challenge that has come up is uh, you don't just think of investment or growth for the sake of increasing the wealth and developing the country. The challenge of one, uh, an, an investment or growth that is environmentally friendly is key today. Is this something that has come up maybe in the last uh, 10 years where today we talk of green economies and uh, really caring about uh, environment as you think of growth. Number two, which is key, which they bring up is the issue of uh, uh, inequality in terms of income. We've had growth models in the past where you you see a country is growing, but the, the issue of income inequality becomes a big problem. So mm -hmm. how do you structure your, your growth model that you ensure there's these equal uh, opportunities across the, the population? So that's, that's very key in, as we think of this uh, development today. So this kind of uh, attracting investors from outside, uh, we always talk of a win-win situation. Uh, as you, you said, maybe some of these investors come with political agendas behind that. Fine. What's important for us is to, to see how our agenda is being uh, met by these investors coming in. If, uh, as people want to put, like a China is coming to, to, to Africa, investing in Africa, not purposely for the sake of growing Africa, but for their political uh, interests, it is in our interest or it is our responsibility as Africans, or in this case as Rwanda, to ensure that Chinese investment coming to Rwanda is benefiting us as a country, and we end up really we get a win-win situation. So, because you have political interests as well, I mean both human and political interests. Exactly. Yeah. So, I think the most important thing is really us, the the, the the destination of these investments, to know what we want from this kind of investment we are getting from either West or from uh, uh, Asia and how that benefits our population, how that benefits our growth agenda. And how do you do that specifically? Do you, do you use um, tax incentives, uh, uh, transfer of wealth plans to, to make that happen, to, to make sure you get the inclusiveness? How, how do you, what are the mechanisms you use? I, I think one is, as government, we, 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 are, we are supposed to, to invest where private sector think it's not uh, fancy, it's not really that profitable. We are supposed to 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 to, to be like the, the the guinea pigs of this kind of investment that mm. private sector won't easily go into. Mm. But then there are other lucrative areas where private sector will be interested in, and we leave, we leave that to the private sector. Then we go into other sectors where, after creating an enabling environment or after creating a market, they are then used you bring in private sector, you sell to the private sector. So otherwise, what, what you said about our, uh, our change or shift in financing our development or financing our budget is yes. we've, we've made different reforms in the past, mainly uh, reforms that enable investments. And we've seen our private sector growing. We've seen our private and our taxes growing at an average of 20% nominally, 20% per year. So this increases our taxes, and therefore it increases the, the share of our budget being mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, financed by our taxes. And of course, as we know, in the past we've been seeing aid going up as well. So this increase was not just because uh, we're not able to, to, to raise taxes, but we were, because we've been, we've been able to, to, to prove that we can put aid to good use, We've seen more uh, donors willing to give us more money because we have, I would say, uh, good development programs, and therefore that increased the amount of aid and increased the, the share of aid in our budget. But as the West is having their own challenges, it's sort of being capped at a certain level. So it's, you see right. 
aid capped as, uh, as in nominal terms, but you see our taxes going up, and therefore the ratios change easily. But they play on each other in a positive way. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. Chandra, and then Mr. Arakawa. I, I don't have the, you know, the experience of development in government positions like my, my co-panelists here. And so I hope I didn't come across as suggesting that uh, investments are bad or donoring, don the, uh, donor aid is bad. But I do think we all will be honest and say that much aid has not necessarily translated into the sort of progress we wanted over the last 50, 60 years. That is not to say a great deal has been achieved as well. But I think it's important uh, to distinguish between growth and development. And this, this is a very important distinction to be had. Uh, much, at least I can speak from the Asia-Pacific point of view, what I've seen, much economic growth in Asia has come at a huge expense. Okay, so of course it's lifted hundreds of millions of people, but I would argue it has worsened the, the, the conditions in which the ability of those left behind to come through. And that, that, and particularly in terms of quality of life, resource issues, etc., principally because that economic model we've adopted, as I said before, seeks, thrives on externalizing costs. Okay, I think we all agree on that. So the question now is, well, where, where do we, how do we go forward? My, my point is that I think Asian policymakers, etc., understand this, but they don't know what to do because the narrative is still very much that of the World Bank, the IMF, all of these, this is what you should do. So I think this is a very important rethinking that's going on. The other point I will make is, you know, investors are all good people, but investors want their pound of flesh. So when they come and invest in a developing world country, they want their pound of flesh, which is usually given in forms of externalization, of course, pioneer status, this, 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 doesn't make them bad. We need to rethink how that will work in uh, the different, a different form of Asia. So I am just suggesting, and I'll finish off, that when we look at aid, and I'm not an aid expert, but I have worked in the aid arena, I've lived in Africa, etc. We need to understand that it has created a whole element of distortions. But if you look at Asia, Asia is not poor. There's a lot of money here. A lot of money which is squandered because we have adopted an economic model that concentrates development in certain areas. So just to share, one of the things I'm trying to do here in Asia is to create a social investment fund. One that blends financial returns with social, social impacts as well. And there's a whole body of work. But guess what? Try and raise some money for something like that, and it's very difficult. Try and raise money for another shopping mall or a, sh a high-rise condominium in Shenzhen, Kuala Lumpur, or Mumbai, and bang. Why? Because capital flows work in certain ways. We need to create in Asia, in my view, a completely new asset class, devoid of donors, devoid of aid, where the wealthy in this part of the region understand it's in their interest to start to invest in this new asset class, I call it missing market finance, so that they start building the, creating the building blocks for a future in which their current assets will be protected because, if you can use the cliche, the bottom of the pyramid needs are being fulfilled. Right. I'll finish by saying, if we don't do that in the next 20 years, we'll have, say, 1 billion Asians. At the moment, it's about 650 million Asians who are in the consuming classes. Let's assume another billion enter the consuming classes, which will, by the way, rock the world in terms of resource implications. There'll still be 2.5 billion Asians who are on the periphery. My God, they'll be very angry because they'll have that mobile phone, no toilet, to look at you, how you and I live. Right. And that, that is the dilemma. And that's why governments need to look differently. And the wealthy in Africa and Asia need to stop looking at the West for money. Of course, some countries, I, I understand, need it. But we need to very, very carefully think about this. Thank you. We're, we're going to come to your questions in just a minute. But, Mr. Arakawa, I do want to make a point. Well, the, 
Brian mentioned about aid versus investment, and uh, Rebecca mentioned uh, referred that. I fully agree with that what uh, Rebecca said, and uh, basically the aid versus investment. This looks like uh, government versus uh, private. Uh, if you recall, the World Bank uh, in it was 1994 when the World Bank published the uh, so-called East Asian Miracle. The approach to the to the Southeast Asian countries uh, is so-called market-friendly approach. That means compatible each other and complement each other. So that clearly shows the nature of the assistance. And that's one. Secondly, the most of the Asian countries do not didn't have any so much aid dependence. They like in Vietnam, uh, 1994. They opened the door to the market economy. Then. Uh, to some extent, in those days, it is dependent. Now, but it's totally less dependent. That's the second point. The third point is, the, in my experience for the past 35 years in Asia, the, the how to use the aid money for investment. It's a, they used the aid money for critical projects in critical sector. Not in the long run, they continue to borrow and, and continue to depend on the external resources. They did it in a very strategic manner. And the last point is, the, even the PPP, for instance, there are a variety of the approaches. PPP is like uh, public versus uh, pri private. But the real story is that, like a uh, farmer power project, for instance, the, in Vietnam, for instance, the, we finance under the aid money, first phase, and summer power project, and including the substations, then uh, right away and the transmission as well. Then second phase, there will be a very less risks there because right. Uh, 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 right away has already secured and the substation was already done and uh, various uh, surrounding infrastructure has been done. Therefore, the, always this kind of, you know, overseeing the total risk and uh, minimize the risk, then uh, design that. Again, a, bl so, a blended approach. Right. That's yep. my point. Yeah. Yep. And, I Minister, have, and then I, I have go some to your comments. questions. First, the choice between toilet and uh, uh -huh. mobile. <laughs> uh, that's not a choice. In my country, we have both mobile and toilet. But the toilet is not what you expect in the city. My rural areas are better uh, in sanitation than the urban areas. You see, so there are ways of balancing the two. What to me looks important is the challenges. Challenges, actually. Challenges for the new champions. Challenges for the new champion is to find more energy resources. How? What technology? Solar energy? Uh, less energy intensive industry, whatever it is, this is number one. The second challenge is population. And management of population is essentially by the root which is called human development. If you invest in health, if you invest in sanitation, if you invest in education, you are going, doing the best thing for population, population management. Third is food, and that is very basic, agricultural production must be given consistent parity. It's not parity of today, and then you forget about it and the beginning of 10 years. No. It's a consistently, it has to be attended to. And these days, of course, we, we have the problem of environment. How do you have sustainable development so that the world for my children, for my grandchildren, is the world that I enjoyed in terms of resources? This is the biggest challenge that the, that the new champions should have. Uh, inequality has to be attacked, and inequality cannot be left to the private sector only. Inequality requires public investment, but these days we know, I mean, uh, production of public goods by private investment. That's what you have to go for, which is the PPP, public-private partnership. The best example given by uh, the today's young, uh, I mean, former Prime Minister, Mr. D David, I mean, Gordon Brown. That's something that we have to use in a much bigger way in the Asian subcontinent. You are right. 
that we have, we have plenty of resources. That's not in shortfall. What is in shortfall is not the overbearing public sector, but a regulating public sector, a public sector that regulates rather than invests itself. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Are there any questions in the audience? Please, two down front here. First man here in the white, and then we'll go to the end. And, and if it, your name and who you'd like to address your question to, please. My name is Mohammed Pate. I'm from Nigeria. I think the Minister of Finance from Bangladesh raised the issue of population. I think it was missing from the discussion of the panelists. The fact that Asia is actually at the end of its demographic dividend period, it's closing. Aging is coming up, and Africa is on the other side. I would like to hear from the Minister of Finance from Rwanda what the implication of this shift is in terms of growth for the future. Thank you. It's a great question. So a really long-term horizon yes. on the continent versus maybe the cycles a little closer to maturity in Asia, or at least parts of Asia. Yeah, I, I see it in two ways. One is on the, in terms of the quality of our population. There's the numbers, but also the quality of our population in terms of the... Today we have more skilled uh, manpower in Africa than, than yesterday. And therefore, today we are better positioned to attract the industries now that we are attracted to, to Asia in the last 10 years or so. Today here, industry is closing up down here in China and shifting to Africa because it's became, becoming more expensive to produce from here than it would be in Africa. So we are supposed to be positioning ourselves, take advantage of this shift in the, in the world order in terms of... Uh, the cost of production. Uh, to me, I see that as a, as a chance for Africa, as, as an opportunity for us to tap into in terms of the, the different uh, businesses that are looking at Africa now as, a, as the next destination in terms of uh, cheaper, uh, cheaper means of production. Of course, we need to do a lot. We need to do a lot in terms of facilitating these investments. We still have issues of energy. I think the minister talked about of energy here. We still have issues of expensive energy. We have cheap labor, but we have expensive energy. We have poor infrastructure, transport to, to the markets. So uh, to me, I see it as an opportunity to us. We just need to have all the other cards uh, put in the right position. Thank you. Really, really quickly. I mean, really quickly. So we can get to these other. Go ahead, Rebecca. No, go ahead. No, I think that the, the demographic question is, is a very important one, and it has been one of the factors for the rapid rate of growth also of the emerging economies. You know, apart from the rate of investment, it has been the demographic bonus. And we have to prepare for the aging population. But the, I, 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 I don't want to leave the demographics only to the numbers, but also to the gender issues. Because, you know, we haven't talked about gender equality in the equation for economic growth, for more equality, and for intergenerational also equality. So in the, in the, the, the contribution of, the, of women to economic growth of a, and a more sustainable a model of development is as important for Africa and Asia as all the other variables that we have talked about. In fact, isn't it, it without investment in the economic and social empowerment of women, we probably don't achieve the goals? Doesn't well, happen, right? Well, in the MDGs, it, it is very clear. Yeah, you doesn't know, happen. There, there, there have been a, all, all, the, all the stories and all the research in terms of the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals, right. you know, the cross-cutting issue of gender equality Always. has been at the center. But, but still, but, action is lacking. But Asia's <laughs> demographics is a mixed bag. Okay, China is aging, India is not. And please also be very careful that the, democratic, the, the demographic dividends should not, uh, Africa should not be seduced to be the next place to which externalities are shifted. You know, in Davos, I sat with the, for the late and very great ex -pres the president of Ethiopia who passed away. And we talked about this. He said, we do not want to be the next place that because now China is expensive, you know, we get a chance to make some cheap shoes. So you have to be very careful about this sort of uh, conventional wisdom about how things work in the world. We're in a very different time. We have to think very differently about 
that that conventional wisdom. I mean, I don't think urbanization is necessarily the the natural way towards uh, you know human destiny. So let's let's come down to this. Well, it'll be our last question, and I have a feeling many of you will want to jump in no matter what the question is. So, which is fine, which is good. <laughs> Uh, Jamie, Drum Jamie Drummond from uh, One, founder of One. It's a global advocacy organization focused on the Millennium Development Goals, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. You've spoken about so much, there's so many questions you could ask. But one is um, the issue of transparency in the natural resource sector was mentioned. A few weeks ago, the SEC spoke. The ruling is final. Uh, companies listed on the American Stock Exchange will have to make public their payments to governments. That is about to be agreed and harmonized in Europe covering 80% of all companies in the extractive sector globally who are listed. The outliers will then be largely Asian companies. How do you recommend we best go about a campaign to encourage and work with authorities and companies here so that transparency gets rolled out so there's a global level playing field so that the natural resource wealth of countries can be used best for the benefit of their people? I wanted to ask a second question which is about how do we design the new replacement millennium development goals in your opinion. Oh my God. I, I won't have time for that. <laughs> we won't have time for that. But, but we, we were having that conversation again in the speaker's room. And what, so um, what's your view, start with the two ministers, at the, uh, at the end of the day, will, for instance, the Chinese investment in Africa right now be a net positive or a net negative without drawing conclusions that aid is better than investment and so forth, because it goes to this question of transparency and, and making sure that, you know, Minister, you were making the point that your interests are served as well as not just Chinese investors, but any foreign investors. How, how do you respond to the transparency question? No, I, I think the most important thing is uh, transparency is key to, to development, as we are saying to development, and this is development that is uh, across uh, the population. And transparency is also key to, to, to limit the, the negative uh, forces behind this extraction, extractive industries mainly, because uh, this has been one of what they call the, the, the source cast to, to Africa. So as you increase transparency, uh, populations or countries are able to track what is uh, generated from their their minerals or from their resources and how it's being used for the benefit of the of the country. So I think that's very key. It's key f for the purposes of uh, now distributing or benef using these resources for the benefit of the population, not for the benefit of the few. Uh, investors in these areas and a few uh, politicians or other key figures within these countries. So I think that's very key as we talk of this new development agenda. If we are able to, to, to enforce and emphasize this uh, transparency, maybe we won't even need aid tomorrow. We are able to use our resources and use these resources to develop our countries. And do you think so it will happen country by country or will it happen through a different frame, a different mechanism? To me, I think it has to, to really be to come from within our countries. Right. Imposed from outside, good, but I don't think to work if it's not really supported and coming from our countries in general. Yeah. Any other thoughts on transparency, specifically to that question? Yes. So, not exactly uh, the case that you mentioned, <laughs> but uh, I had identified four challenges in what I said. Really, quick, are, really quickly, we're over and time. And these are physical challenges. There are two other challenges which are very important. One is corruption. Yes. And that is where transparency is important. And we must have all kinds of processes and procedures which ensure transparency and accountability. Transparency is not enough. enough. Simultaneously, accountability must be there. And therefore, it is important. And the other thing is governance. And for governance, what you need are building institutions. Of course, human development will largely contribute to that, but these are the two areas where we should also, uh, Asia, uh, Latin America, Africa, who are thinking of the future, future champions have to really, really, really confront these three issues. Corruption, governance, uh, what was the other thing I said? Uh, I mean, corruption means transparency and accountability. That's right. And the other one I said is institutions. Right. So let's. So we started a little late. So 30 seconds each. So Chandran, write down 
30-second final thought. Yeah, I, I totally agree that uh, the transparency issue and the traceability has to be at the national level. I think all of us know that trying to impose it from outside creates a lot of different uh, uh, resentments. And frankly, the biggest players in the world, every day in the week, we hear find ways to move, move around it. So it has to be very local, etc. The last thing I would say is we all find it very comfortable talking about transparency, corruption, etc. The question is, how do you do it? And I think fundamentally, until we challenge an economic model which thrives on this externalization costs, underpricing, etc., we're not going to address the issue of transparency right. because it's nice stuff to say, but it's much more fundamental at the core of the economic model. Mr. Arakawa. Well, uh, coming back to the topic of uh, demography, it is a really exp uh, uh, Japan is experiencing now. And uh, as you know, the Japanese diet has already passed an increase of consumption tax with a social security reform. And uh, this is, in a sense, a little bit too late. Even so, uh, one of main, one, because one of the main source of huge budget deficit of uh, Japanese government is owing to that uh, delayed social security reform, particularly health care and uh, pension system. Therefore, the, this is a very, very critical issue. But the speed of demographic onus and uh, policy reform cannot match in case of Japan. Therefore, please keep in mind, always be prepared for that. Very good. Rebecca. Well, two things. Uh, when transparency goes up, the allocation of resources to human development improves. And uh, that, you know, there are many, many research around that. My second point is around the MDGs and the post-2015 agenda. And, and only uh, to, to say, because aid has been uh, put in a wrong light here, that MDGs has galvanized so much effort and energy in the countries themselves to achieve the MDG goals, that the progress that has been achieved during the last 10 years is amazing. And nobody tells the success stories, right. you know? You know, we, we accept that uh, you have to experiment in private sector, in this and that, and you have failures. In aid, if you have failures, it's because aid doesn't do anything good. You know, in the social sectors, you have failures and then you stop the programs. <laughs> mm -hmm. In the private sector, you don't do that. You have failures, you do it again until you learn how to do it better. And I think that that's, that's so really what we point. need to... Uh, uh, to do. And the post-2015 agenda, I think that will be one of the most important discussions that we can have for the development agenda of the future. And uh, I, I think that the uh, energy and the uh, 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 interest that has, you know, uh, 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 come to the high-level panel of the Secretary General is amazing. Everybody wants to be there. So it shows that everybody thinks that this will be a very central piece of the development agenda in the years to come. Final word. The minister's got a meeting. <laughs> I know, but go ahead. No, okay. Final word. No, I, I think uh, this was an interesting topic, but what I can say in, in uh, conclusion is we have bigger opportunities today than challenges. How best we work together as, as the world, let me put it like that, to, to take advantage of these opportunities and be able to... to to grow our, 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 our nations, I think that's a key point that we should be discussing. How best can we take advantage of the, the current opportunities, uh, the, uh, the technology, the, uh, the different prayers in the world? It's no, it's no longer one-sided. We are all uh, prayers in, in, in the matters of, of the world. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's a good time. And it's what's important for us to really work together and take advantage of the existing it's a great, It's a great way to end. You know, I'm struck by, you know, it's obvious that the political and economic power is shifting. What was so clear in this discussion is that maybe the same way in business that reverse innovation is happening, products are being developed in emerging markets and then being exported into developed markets, maybe the framework around development and aid in the blending uh, framework maybe comes out of this part of the world and in the South, uh, that then gets exported across the world. It was a fascinating way to think about that frame. Help me thank uh, our panel. And thank you for coming.